name is Maureen Taylor. I was born in Detroit, which is weird, but I actually spent 99.9% uh, .9 of my life uh, growing up in Ontario, so down near Windsor is where I grew up. Um, my first career was as a journalist, as a lot of people know, so I spent um, 25 years, most of it at the CBC, but also at TV Ontario. And the latter part of my uh, journalism career was spent as the medical health reporter for CBC's The National, both radio and TV. And uh, that was where I guess I sort of started to wonder if I'd made the wrong career choice and maybe I should have gone into medicine. Um, and one day this PA program, physician assistant program, uh, memo came across my desk as a story idea from McMaster. I had no idea what physician assistants were. Um, and rather than do a story on it, I actually ended up applying to the program. At the time, I thought of it as a way to go back to school to learn more about medicine, and that would make me a better reporter. I also needed to get away from the CBC or I was going to kill someone. So I was 48 years old. And um, I took a two-year leave of absence to do the program. But when I was graduating, I discovered that things were, morale was still really low at the CBC, and my friends encouraged me not to come back. So I went out and practiced as a PA, and I'm still doing it 10 years later. Fantastic. And um, what drew you to the PA profession specifically? Well, for me, this, this doesn't sound like a really... Um, a uh, wonderful reason for doing it. But as I said, I actually didn't expect to practice as a PA. It was a way to get a mini medical education. Um, and for me, as somebody with a background in journalism, history, political science, English, I wouldn't have had the science prerequisites to get into a program like uh, the one at uh, the U of T, for example, or at University of Manitoba. So really, McMaster's approach to medicine, the way they approach medical school, and, and then the PA school, was really the only one that could have worked for me. Um, and at 48, you're certainly not going to start all over again, going back for science uh, prerequisites and, and trying to get into med school. So that's what drew me to it. What keeps me there, I think, is the idea that I can provide this kind of hands-on, patient care, very similar to what physicians uh, do, but I do it in conjunction with the entire medical team, and uh, I really enjoy that. I, I approach my job as I would a journalism story, where suddenly I would be handed an assignment and I had to research everything about that particular story that day. So I know how to go out and research information and gather it quickly and assimilate it. I'm never be going to become the expert in that particular uh, issue on that day, um, but I can say that I'm becoming very comfortable, at least with infectious diseases now, after doing it for almost five years. And how was your experience being part of the inaugural class at McMaster? Yeah, that was just amazing. I, I mean, to, um, to be one of that, that class, I can still see everybody's faces sitting around doing the, the problem-based learning. and. Uh, Dr. John Cunnington, who was just so great to have been able to have him be um, not only the director of the program, but providing a lot of the learning for us at the time. It was wonderful. I'm still really good friends with uh, a lot of the people in my class. I just went on a trip to California and Arizona with a few of them. So um, it's always, it's nice to be groundbreaking uh, like that. I think there were hiccups, of course, that have been worked out since. Um, but yeah, those were some good years for me. Mm -hmm. And what did you feel your medical journalism background brought to your education and practice of medicine? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, asking patients uh, personal and uncomfortable questions is not a problem for me. I mean, that's what I did as a journalist. So I think that I have good communication skills. I think I deliver news to patients it's both bad and good news, in, in a way that's accessible to them because I always had to do that as a medical reporter. I had to take complicated studies in journals and then break them down into bits and pieces that an audience would understand. So I think that that's all good. I think I'm used to working uh, quickly to a deadline and I think I'm used to working as part of a team because especially in television journalism, you've got a cameraman, uh, you've got a, a, a producer usually, maybe a writer on the national desk, you've got an assignment editor, so you're all trying to work together to make the best story possible, and that's what we have to do as well uh, as PAs. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And with that being said, um, in your own words, what is a physician assistant? I tell people uh, that we are like the residents who never go away. So that's really works well with physicians and nurses and other people in the healthcare profession. You have to massage that a little bit for the lay public who may not even understand what a resident is at the end of the day. But when you think about it, uh, and I've been told this by physicians that I've worked with in both emergency medicine as well as ID, that we reach the level of a senior resident, a very senior resident, and what's nice about it is we provide those physicians that we work with that, that continuity. They can teach us things like they do residents, but the problem is the residents then leave after a few weeks. And um, what we provide the physician with is someone who, oh yeah, I remember you taught me how to do that. I know how you like the neuro exam done. I know how you like your documentation. And so they can rely on us to to provide that continuity of care with their patients as well. So that's how I explain physician assistants. To the public sometimes, you have to tell them, we're like nurse practitioners, but we're trained more in the medical model that physicians are. So that's sort of how I explain it to them. I have to say that in the last two or three years, when I just say I'm a physician assistant, I really don't get patients asking me what that is anymore. They're just kind of happy to see me. What would you say the attributes are of an ideal PA? Well, obviously empathy for the, the patient and putting patient-centered care first. Um, attributes, obviously you have to be able to think on your feet and have a good sort of general knowledge of pathophysiology and that goes without saying, right? Every healthcare professional should have a good knowledge of what it is they're practicing. Um, but I think even more so for PAs is we, we have to know what we don't know and when to ask for help. Um, the nicest thing about being a PA for me has been to see and acknowledge that I'm growing all the time and I'm becoming more confident all the time and it's, it's great. We, we generally get residents, uh, we call them fellows in ID who come through and I then treat them as my staff for a little while and report to them and I think they're always surprised at how much I already know about infectious diseases and I certainly know as much as most of the general med medicine residents who come through and who would have thought that about me like 12 years ago if you told me that I was going to be uh, uh, practicing at that kind of level I would have told you you were crazy. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reporting on the stories and now yeah. I'm actually uh, living it almost. Yeah, it's, 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 even I wake up and wonder if this has all been a dream. Mm -hmm. So what was your very first job out of school as a PA? As a PA, uh, my first job was at Sunnybrook um, Hospital in Toronto in the emergency department. Three of us from McMaster were all hired at the same time and we were lucky in that there was already an American trained PA there. So the ground you know, had been set, the physicians in the eMERGE had already known what a PA could do. And um, I, I have to say, I worked with about 30 different physicians. Everybody bought into the PA role and there was never any issue. We had some issues with nursing at the beginning, but um, I always approached that as I, I, I let them know right off the bat how much I respected what they brought to the table. And I wouldn't say, you know, I was 100% great with everybody, but I know that many of them became my friends and respected what PAs do. And I have to say now that I've moved to a different position, um, and there were many PAs there before, I think we've paved the way, really, for the PAs coming after us and that these, these things are not so much of an issue as they were when I first graduated. So, yeah, emergency medicine was, was first. And what did you enjoy about eMERGE? I loved the fact that I saw a little bit of everything and uh, honed my skills procedure-wise. I mean, I never did, I was in a big academic hospital, so you, I had to acknowledge that there were residents who also needed to get their uh, emergency skills up to bat. So did I ever successfully intubate anybody? No. Did I try? A couple times. Lumbar punctures I did, suturing I became very comfortable with and, and helping to set fractures and, and put casts on. I liked that 
fact, though, that you saw the gamut from things that were rather trivial to things that were really, really serious. And we were a trauma hospital as well, so got to look in on some of that. What I didn't like at my age was the hours. And um, that was really what started my decision eventually to, I, I was going to have to get out of emergency medicine, um, whether no matter what, whether an opportunity came along or not, it was really getting to me. I'm not a good sleeper at the best of times, so to ask me to come home at 8 o'clock in the morning and go to bed and get eight hours sleep, that's not going to happen. So, yeah, those were the things that I liked and didn't like about it. And how did you come across this job for infectious disease? It was so um, serendipitous. I remember meeting another PA, Melissa DeClo, I think at a Kappa meeting or something. And I found out that she worked in infectious diseases. So a little background, my late husband was a microbiologist and infectious disease doctor. And um, he and I would talk about infectious diseases at the dinner table all the time. And I always, as a reporter, because I covered things like SARS and H1N1 flu, I always liked infectious diseases. When I found out she had a job in it, I'm like, how did you get that sweet job? And she said, I know, I have the best job in the world. So that was in the back of my mind and just wishing that some other ID physicians would want a PA. And she called me up and said, I'm going on mat leave. It was her first pregnancy. And she said, they want to hire someone to fill in on my mat leave. And this was at a time where I was back at Sunnybrook and Emerge part-time, but still doing the odd evening and night and wanting to find something that was better for my lifestyle. So, and I was in a position where I could take a chance on a job that might only be a year long. That didn't really bother me. So I went over to do her mat leave. And we had talked, Melissa and I, about when she came back, maybe we would even be able to job share, which would have been fantastic. But she moved to Ottawa during this pregnancy, and she's up there now, and so she never did come back. And I've just stayed at the job full time, and now it's almost five years. That's incredible. And um, I was actually speaking to Melissa recently. You oh. have now been at that job longer than she was. Yeah, and, and yeah, I just want to say I'm not as good at the job as she was. She was particularly uh, brilliant and oh, I think the physicians miss her every day that's not to say they don't that I don't bring some things to the table but uh, they miss her all the time I'm a little sick of hearing about it actually oh, okay I'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> so for those that don't know uh, what is the specialty of infectious disease well, infectious disease, the way that, that we do it is um, when people are admitted to a hospital for whatever reason, they're admitted under different services, as you know. And sometimes they have infections as the reason they come in, but sometimes they come in for some other reason, and I can give some examples, and then an infection becomes an issue in the hospital. So you consult the infectious disease services. So infections obviously are everything from flu uh, to a wound infection after surgery to pneumonia to a gastrointestinal issue. We deal with a lot of abscesses. You'd be amazed at where pus collects in the body and it has to be drained and treated with antibiotics. And we manage a lot of the antibiotic use in the hospital because as many PAs will know, antibiotic resistance around the world is becoming a huge problem. And we encourage the physicians in the hospital who may be putting their patients on antibiotics to get us involved because we can help select the best antibiotic and the one that will do the least amount of damage as far as promoting resistance. So for the most part, most um, physicians in the hospital are pretty adequate at um, managing infectious disease when it does come out. So um, apart from asking about antibiotics, what other circumstances are they consulting the ID service? You know, I would challenge the premise of the question off the bat because what I'm finding in, is as medicine gets more and more specialized and as resistant organisms take over the normal flora in our body, I think a lot of physicians are not comfortable coming up with an antimicrobial regimen for their patients. As especially physicians, I wouldn't say that's true of general internists, of obviously they they're very comfortable. Uh, but as surgeons, for example, they have a lot to think about as far as just managing the surgical aspects. And then when they find out their patient's knee swab is growing something that usually comes from the colon, uh, you know, it's just easier for them to contact the 
ID uh, specialists in the hospital and say, what do you think this patient should be on and for how long? And what else do we need to do? So, so that's what we bring to the table. We, duration of antibiotics is an issue. Sometimes people are left on way too long. And then there's the other issue of source control. So if you have an infection of a prosthetic knee, it's not just a matter of leaving that hardware in and putting the patient on Keflex for three weeks. Uh, it may require you to remove the hardware, actually, put in a spacer, leave the patient you know, on antibiotics for three months, and then bring them back to the OR to put it in a new So it's, this is where I think ID and surgery and that example working together can uh, promote better outcomes for patients over the long term. And apart from uh, prosthetic uh, joint infections, um, what are some other conditions that you see come through? Well, obviously, one of the big ones um, in hospital, acquired infections in hospital, has been C. difficile. And that's become sort of a side specialty for me uh, because I actually do the fecal transplants in the hospital for people with refractory C. difficile. So that's been one. Um, uh, as I said, there's a lot of I'll give you an example. This week we had a patient who had had a benign liver cyst for years that was just found incidentally on a CT scan. And they were just sort of monitoring it every few years with another CT. It wasn't causing him any issues, but all of a sudden it was. Uh, abdominal pain and stuff, and when they redid the CT, it had grown huge. It had practically taken over his liver, and he was febrile. So we, sus we got involved because of the fever, and sure enough, that benign cyst had become infected, and now it was an abscess. So that's the kind of thing, I really enjoy those sorts of cases, because the mystery is, what is the infection? And how did this become infected? Where did the bacteria come from? So we sit around a lot and discuss the pathophysiology of how infections happen. And to me, that's like playing detective again. And I love that aspect of it. And then there's just the regular old, you know, diabetic feet, which can be quite disgusting. Uh, and, and, you know, cellulitis, is this cellulitis or is it just, you know, chronic venous stasis? So all of those things I see and really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the um, fecal transplants? Yes. Um, so C. difficile, as a lot of people know, is, is an infection that mainly happens uh, in the hospital, but is starting to be seen in the community. And it usually happens when you've been put on antibiotics. They're there to destroy the bad bacteria, but as I tell patients in a very... Uh, elementary way. They also destroy the good flora. And when they do that, it allows C. difficile to take over in our gut and causes this profuse watery diarrhea. And sometimes very ill people can die of it. And we've seen that. Um, it was a huge problem in Canadian hospitals back in um, the early 2000s. And I don't think anybody realized how easily it spreads around the hospital. So there were drugs to treat it. First, metronidazole. And that's not it's starting not to work so well for those with more severe disease, so we treat them with vancomycin. But some people keep relapsing anyway. We know that about a third of people will relapse, and of those who relapse a first time, about 50% will relapse a second time. So <laughs> I don't know who the first one was to try this. It was actually a chi done in chi ancient China. But by taking the healthy stool, uh, or sorry, the stool from a healthy donor, and transplanting it into a patient with C. difficile, we can repopulate their gut with good bacteria. The way that we do it is through uh, a simple uh, rectal enema, kind of, like it's just very done in 20 seconds and it's over. Um, so when I came to Michael Guerin Hospital, the ID physicians were already offering fecal transplants to their patients. And I expressed an interest in this because I'd actually done a story about it as a health reporter, won an award for that story. Um, and I told them I'd like to get involved. Um, these are usually done on, on an outpatient basis and I don't really see patients in, as outpatients in their clinic, but I wanted to get involved. So I started being the one to make the poo. And at first we had a blender for it, but now I have something way more high tech that just involves a styrofoam cup and a popsicle stick. And then I went from mixing the poo for them to actually doing the transplants. Um, and uh, I think Jeff Powis and I, my ID doctor, we are probably 
doing maybe up to 60, 70 a year, and we get referrals from patients all over Ontario because this isn't offered in very many places. Um, and it's really gratifying to see patients get better with the fecal transplant. And I'm actually, you know, that's one of my jobs is to spread the word that it's not that hard to do, that really this should be a, the responsibility of ID doctors in other parts of the country. And um, we've been contacted recently by an ID physician and his team in, um, I think it's the Sioux, and they want our protocol and to have us help them set up a program there. So that's really gratifying. Yeah, excellent. And how would you describe your typical day or week um, in the life of being a PA and ID? Well, I work with three different ID doctors, and so they all rotate one week. So um, every three weeks, it's, it's back to the other doctor again. I really enjoy that. Um, so when I get in in the morning, uh, the first thing I'll do is I'll look at uh, the new consult list, as we call it. So has there anybody, has have any physicians consulted us overnight or early in the morning? And how many new patients are there to see? And I will usually get started with those. And then when I see them, I do all the research, maybe order some extra tests. If they've already been started on antibiotics, I make sure that it's the right one. And I might go see two or three of those. And then the physician, depending on how they like to work, we get together and we talk about them. And then we go see all those new patients together once and we put a plan in place. And then we have our follow-up list. So when we see these new patients, it's not just a matter of seeing them the first day and then signing off. Some of them need us to follow along because there might be outstanding tests in microbiology and imaging. So they become my follow-ups as well. And I spend the rest of my day going to see my follow-ups and writing notes. And let's face it, I spend a lot of my day writing, dictating notes. And that's a complaint of a lot of people who work in medicine now. We seem to be quite tethered to our computers and not really spending as much time with patients as we would like. Um, so, you know, my day is about, is usually 8.30 to 5 or, or sometimes a little bit later. Yeah. Any call overnight or weekends? No. That's the wonderful thing. Uh, when I first talked to Melissa DeClo about this job, she said I don't work nights and I don't work weekends and I knew that, that was the job for me. So it's, it's good. Great. And how often do you liaison with your supervising physician? Yeah, we have the kind of relationship where we're in constant uh, contact with each other anyway by text. Um, even if it's like, do you want a coffee, and, you know, this morning. So I feel very comfortable uh, changing some patients' antibiotics, but others, I feel like I want to chat with them first, but it isn't even a chat. It's like, can I change that urtapenum to Piptazo? And often the physician is already looking on the computer themselves at the new patients. So we're, we're totally in sync. It isn't the kind of thing, like they've never said to me, Maureen, I don't ever want to see you again you know, stopping the antibiotics until you talk to me. That's not, it's just kind of evolved gradually as I gain more confidence, then I do more things independently. But I also, uh, as I gain more confidence, it hasn't stopped me from being able to consult them when I just want that second opinion and that blessing. Um, so I, I actually feel I have as much autonomy as I need. Uh, and, and that's because I have a great relationship with all the doctors that I work with. And that's because the PA who came before me had already laid that groundwork for me. And does it differ a lot between the three docs that you work with? Um, they differ in that one of them likes to, me to let them know when I've seen a new patient right away. Because we call those the one-offs. We want it, he, he would rather hear about the new patients as I do them through the day because he has so many other responsibilities in the hospital. Whereas a couple of the other doctors that I work with, they'd rather I see them all in the morning, have lunch, and then let's sit down at one o'clock and let's go over everything all at once. So it's kind of like a, a bolus of patients and follow-ups at one o'clock. And then we go around rounding on them all together. And then I get back to my desk and I can dictate all my notes. Um, so it's just it's just how they prefer to or organize their day. And it really doesn't have anything to do with them not trusting that I haven't done something right in the morning. You know what I mean? It's, it's physician preference. Fair enough. And um, what's your interaction like with the nurses on the floor or great. other healthcare providers? Absolutely great. And I have to say that because I, um, 
I'm a consulting service and I don't really have to hang out in a specific ward all the time. I'm all over the hospital from the oncology, respirology ward to the emergency department. But I, we have PAs in our hospital who are in internal medicine are, and basically spend whole days on the wards. And those nurses on those wards already are used to the PAs interacting with them and helping them. And the, the thing about the nurses is I spend more time talking to them about what did the bowel movements look like this morning? Did this patient have a fever this morning? And I don't really have to instruct nurses to do something because it's all done electronically. All of our orders are electronic, so if I want a, an antibiotic stopped and another one started, I put that into the system and the nurses don't care who put it in. It comes up in their system and they do it. Uh, same PSWs, uh, we have RPNs and RNs. Um, obviously physio and social work and OT I work I work with or interact with but this idea of will they take orders from me has, is not an issue in our hospital because of the electronic record but also because of the hard work that's already been done to help all of the other allied health understand what PAs do. Any tips for hospitals that are looking to integrate PAs on how they can foster that kind of environment? Um, I. Only in that, you know, do some education ahead of time. Uh, encourage Allied Health to talk to their friends and colleagues in other hospitals where there are already PAs. Show them the data that shows that PAs don't actually take away nursing jobs. Like, there's absolutely no evidence that we've, we've uh, taken away nurse practitioner or nursing jobs. And if you talk to a few who've had them for a while, I think they'll tell you that, oh my God, I love having the PA because I can never reach the physician, but I always can reach the PA. So that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. And um, what can patients expect um, from, your, from their interactions with you on, uh, on the ID service? I mean, I think that they can expect two things. They will see me almost every day and follow me along, but they will also um, have met the physician who supervises me. So that's something we always do on the first day. Uh, the physician will be there to answer their questions. But they know that when they see me after that, if they have a question that I don't have the answer to right off the bat, I'll speak to my physician and get back to them. A lot of times they will ask me questions that have nothing to do with their infection. A lot of times it's, and so, do you think they're going to take the gallbladder out during this uh, admission or are they going to make me wait? And I'm like, I have no idea. And no control over that. So a lot of it is just educating the patient about what I, can, what I have control over and what I don't. Um, because remember, we're seeing patients, yes, for their infection, but sometimes that's not all that's going on with them. They have a lot of other reasons to be in hospital. And then one other thing I want to add about me that's maybe different from other PAs is I do... In infectious diseases, you wouldn't think we see a lot of patients in, who are palliative, but sometimes we do see patients in that transition from active treatment to palliation, and they may have an underlying infection going on that has nothing to do with whether or how soon they're going to die. I let them know that I'm okay to talk about their death and their goals of care, and things like that. Even though it's not really my bailiwick, if they have questions around that, because I have an interest in palliative care and in dying, I let them know that it's okay to talk to me. And I, you can talk frankly to me about your fears because I've been there myself. And so maybe that's something that I'm adding to my practice that really has nothing to do with my role as an IDPA. So what, are, what are some of the things that you enjoy about ID and what are the things that you find challenging about it as well? Yeah, I, as I, I do enjoy figuring out how this infection came to be for things that aren't obvious. There's epidemiology involved sometimes. So, you know, uh, especially in the hospital when we have an outbreak on a ward, trying to track. I don't have that much to do with that sort of thing, but um, my bosses do, so I listen in on that, and that's, that's fun. Um, I obviously enjoy the, the part where we try to choose the best antibiotic with the narrowest spectrum, if, if people know what that means, because otherwise why not just put everybody on erdipenem, right? But there are good reasons not to, and I take cost into consideration. As you know, I'm a, I 
have a long history of supporting a universal health care system in Canada, and I know that this is in jeopardy, that we're not going to be able to afford it if we keep going at this rate, so I'm a big fan of choosing wisely. Um, so that's what I enjoy. I guess I'd have to say I don't love walking into a room and being overpowered by the smell of diarrhea or a diabetic foot, which can smell like someone's like died in there, um, to be frank. So, you know, those are things, but it, it's okay. There's really almost nothing that grosses me out. I'm trying to think of something that grosses me. No, nothing grosses me out. Uh, so though, but they're, they're not pleasant. Let's put it that way. All right. And, um, how do you keep on top of the latest medical knowledge in infectious disease? Twitter. Uh, Twitter is great. Um, so what I do is I follow journals in infectious diseases and I follow uh, smart micro ID people and it, when I wake first thing in the morning before I even get out of bed I'm running through the Twitter feed and if there is an article that I think I need to read I flag it for, late, for later. Um, uh, so I, I'd say that's mainly how I stay on top of things but also you know we're, we're able to access grand rounds in ID throughout Toronto. So we try to make time in our busy day on Tuesdays to do that, but it's hard. Um, yeah, and then just in talking to my physicians about these things all the time. Mm -hmm. And infectious disease is often challenging for students because of the number yeah. of uh, microorganisms and antibiotics. Right. Any tips on being able to solidify that knowledge for PA students? Well, so this is what I tell the students who do come to me and, and seem scared, because I know how little you get in ID in your training. I don't expect people to know antibiotics, so right off the bat that's that's not going to be their job. But I would like them to know the difference between, it for bacteria anyway, gram positives and gram negatives and just be able to name a few, right? Um, that's fairly easy to get through. Viruses, you'd be surprised, um, we don't actually in hospital end up treating viruses as much as we end up treating bacterial infections. That's just because there's not that much for viruses, right? A lot of time it's just supportive care. So I tell them don't worry too much about viruses, but bacteria, gram positives and gram negatives, and come, come prepared to name a couple and the diseases that they cause. And I think from there you're going you're gonna to go out and see patients on your rotation and it's slowly going to dawn on you which ones are kind of like we call them above the waist and which ones are generally below the waist, right? Though that is oversimplifying, but it's certainly enough for a student to get started. What impact has ID noticed since adding a PA to the service? Yeah, this is all work done before I got there by Melissa and the team, but they actually looked at the data and collected the data and I'm not going to know the study as well as Melissa would, but the gist of it was that they could show that when they got the PA in ID, the patient time of admission and the time to being discharged home was decreased by, I think, a couple of days at least. And this is, the physicians will tell you in plain language, before they had a PA, physicians would put in an ID consult and it might sit there more than a day before they could get to your patient. So this is one extra day of you maybe not knowing whether to start antibiotics, which antibiotics to start, right? But now with the PA, that never happens. We're able to see all of the consults if they come, you know, they come in between 8 and 5.30 at night, and you know that we're going to come up with a plan by the end of that day for your patient. And I think that by having a PA on the way, the reason they were able to get them out of hospital quicker is we come up with a plan for, are you going to go home with an IV and a PICC line? Who's going to follow you up? What imaging are you going to need? And I help arrange all of that. Um, so I think that those are the reasons that I know that if I had to quit the job tomorrow, they would definitely be advertising for another PA to take my place. It's the kind of thing that they'll never be able to live without now. Mm -hmm. And um, do you contribute to resident teaching? We actually don't have as many residents right now as we used to, but when we had the fourth year general internal medicine residents, I would say to them, you know, if, if you have anything to teach me about, especially, you know, pathophys and stuff like that, I'm happy to learn. I used to say that more in the beginning than I do now. Now what I work, the people I work with most uh, from time to time are fellows in ID. So these would be 
R5s, basically. So they're already very knowledgeable. They're about to write their Royal College exam. They are up to speed on all of these drugs and bugs and everything. And so I learn from them. Um, I don't have the clinical clerks in medicine or the R1s that I have to teach, but I do get PA students, obviously. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to how your scope of practice has changed from jobs and then from when you started ID to the end to, to now? Yeah, I think that it, it was very obvious, especially starting off in emergency medicine, that you weren't going to be able to walk in the door right after graduation and be able to start... Um, ordering imaging, like you're not going to be able to order an MRI or a CT with contrast right away. I mean, those are things that you want to be careful and know what the right indication is. And then all the PA students, when they graduate, they want to know what procedures you're doing. Like everybody is very procedure oriented when they come out of school. Um, so it's going to be gradual. The physicians are going to have to watch you do a couple and then they're going to be comfortable letting you do it. We didn't at Sunnybrook have official sign-offs like I need to see you do three and then you can do one alone. It was just sort of a discussion between you and the physician. Um, but your scope of practice definitely grew as you gained more experience and more confidence. Now I'm over in ID, and really for me, what would be a little beyond my scope of practice would no longer be, am I going to put a chest tube in? Because I got to tell you, I don't do that. We have people way better at doing that. My ID physicians don't do that. Um, the procedures that we do, we might do a little abscess draining here and there, and then obviously the fecal transplants. But for me, scope of practice would be, when am I going to be able to be confident enough to know when we have to pull out ivermectin, for example, or col colistin, which is the antibiotic of last resort and is terribly toxic, you know. So we have ID pharmacists we work with as well, and what I notice with my physicians is, they wouldn't even start those things without first talking to the ID pharmacist and discussing, yeah, do we really want to pull this out? What do we got to look for? Um, so that's scope of practice in the ID world, which students are probably listening and going, well, that's kind of boring. But really, for me, it's not. Those are, those are the exciting things. So scope of practice hasn't really, is not as much of an issue for, I think, someone in a consult service like me, as it would be where you're doing a lot of procedures in like an emergency medicine scenario. If a hospital is interested in adding a PA to their infectious disease service, what are some steps they should take or some considerations hmm. they should think about? Yeah. Um, my boss, uh, having already had Melissa before me, uh, told me that he would like to send me to our microbiology lab uh, which is way uptown, uh, for a week of just watching how microbiology works at the bench side. So I went for a week and watched them, you know, take the plates with the agar and put the specimen on it and put it in, you know, the different machines that they have and how they get answers. I have to say, in retrospect, if, I, if they have to do it over again, I think I went too soon in my... Uh, I had really just started, and what would probably have been better would be for me to become more familiar with the different uh, organisms that we would be dealing with, and the different antibiotics that they use to see what's susceptible and what's not, because that's how you, you uh, find out what's resistant, and then go. So it, it almost would have been better a year in, into things. Um, so that would be one thing. Yes, they, they're going to need to learn more about microbiology. Um, but first, give them some practice just with the simple kinds of infections that you're going to run across in the hospital and get comfortable ordering the drugs. It was a long time before, like now I don't have to look up the dose for very many antibiotics anymore. They are there. But if you ask me now what dose we used to give even for, you know, Tylenol 3s when we send people home, I don't know if I remember that. It's amazing how the brain 
takes out the superfluous information that isn't needed anymore because I don't order Tylenol for people anymore. So um, that's what I would, I would say to them, you know, your PA, it will take time, but eventually they'll get very comfortable doing that. And I can't reiterate enough, if an ID doctor has ever had a resident, like an R4, who really took to ID and they were wishing they could stay around because it was so nice having them see patients and making your life easier, that's what a PA could do for you. Um, so I would encourage, and that's really all there is to it. It's, it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. And do you work with medical directives? Yes, we have medical directives, and, and the ones in ID have just been adopted from the ones that were already done for the uh, general internal medicine uh, PA. So we just have a few, do obviously the drugs would be different. And we updated them a little while ago, and that's actually the last time I had to look at them. Excellent. And um, what are some clinical activities that you're involved in outside of being a PA? I'm, I'm lucky in that uh, the physicians I work with do do some research. I wouldn't, we're not like one of the downtown academic centers where we're involved in trials all the time, but um, they do do some. I'm a bit busy to be involved in all of it because, you know, my primary job is seeing the consults in hospital. However, um, there was an issue where one of the ID doctors, Janine, had talked our boss, Jeff, into a trial where we looked at whether dogs could successfully be trained to smell C. difficile. And we were thinking of this as a way to diagnose patients earlier because, I don't know if you know this, but once you collect the specimen and send it to the lab, it can take 48 hours to get a result. And in the meantime, you don't know, should this patient be in isolation? Should we start vancomycin? Should we not? So Janine started the whole thing, found the dog trainer who found the dogs, and they were starting just practicing in the hospital with specimens and going into real rooms. And then Janine, when we want, they wanted to start the actual clinical trial, Janine was on mat leave. Her baby came early. So Jeff turned to me and said, Maureen, I'd like you to take over. You'll be the principal investigator. You'll run the trial, and then you're going to write the paper. And this was amazing for me because I have written other papers that have been published before, but they've all been qualitative things, which more fits with my background as a journalism, uh, as a journalist, but this was quantitative data. And although I had lots of help, lots and lots of help, it was a great experience for me to run that trial and uh, get it published in, in an infectious disease journal just a few weeks ago. Congratulations, that's excellent to hear. Thank and you. And we'll link to the paper. Okay, that'd be great. The yes. final result, just to give it away, is uh, the specificity and sensitivity are not bad, but the dogs did not have great inter-rater reliability, so probably not a way to go in the future. Fair enough. And um, uh, are there any other uh, health initiatives or advocacy initiatives that you're involved in? Yeah, um, I mean, when I was one of the part of the graduating class, I guess that I saw myself as an advocate for the new PA profession, but now I think there are better people to do that now, younger people um, who are carrying that torch. And because of my, uh, my late husband, um, Don Lowe died of a brain tumor in 2013, and this was uh, when the Supreme Court in Canada had not yet ruled on the legality of assisted death. And um, so a lot of people know that I've become an advocate for assisted death since then. Um, Don died uh, with palliative care and uh, conscious, or sorry, uh, yeah, uh, palliative sedation, uh, which was not how he wanted to die. So I kind of made it one of my goals to see it not only legalized in Canada, but accessible. I would say that um, what we've had it for a couple of years now, things are certainly better, and I'm really grateful we have the law, but you'd be surprised how many glitches there still are. Uh, not the least of which is people being able to access it in some religious hospitals and religious nursing homes and things. And just the whole idea of whether you should be able to use an advance directive to ask for MAID, as we call it now, uh, should you get a disease like dementia. So I'm still doing a little bit in, in that front. But to be honest, um, the ID job as a PA keeps me very, very busy, um, and I'm 58 now, and uh, I kind of am thinking of how I'm going to sort of wind things down maybe in uh, three, four years. That's when my kids are finally launched um, and don't uh, 
don't require me as much anymore. I'd like to, I'd like to, my goal would be to work part-time as in job share in ID and then kind of wind that down to retirement and do more travel and stuff like that. You and I are both active on social media mm -hmm. um, and I know there's quite a large community, medical community on Twitter. So apart from reading up on infectious disease, what are you using that platform for? Yeah, it's, I, it's hard to describe Twitter to people who who just think they've scrolled through it and don't understand it, isn't it? Like to describe the difference it makes in your life. There's a community of people that we follow each other, I suppose. But even people in Australia right now, the uh, assisted dying um, in England and Australia, they're back where we were five years ago when I was just starting on that journey. So I'm in contact with those people, not providing them with any anything important, but mostly support. And, you know, keep at it. Don't, you know, it'll happen for you. It, it was like that for us. So there's, there's that. There's the assisted dying. There's the medicine infectious disease. There's journalism. So I still am interested in how the world works and especially politics in Ontario as it pertains to health care. Um, and all of that is, there's that community on Twitter, people I agree with and don't agree with. Um, I now have, I, I'm, I, you probably have way more followers than me, but my kids are very impressed by how many followers I have for some reason. I have like 2,100 I think I'm at now. Um, that's how I use social media, to stay connected, stay on top of things. I don't use it and I'm not great at Facebook because of this, it's not where I put my personal life out there. I just, I'm not somebody who's gonna go on a trip and post a lot of photos for people to see, and I'm never going to use Twitter for that. I consider Twitter more professional, and I actually don't really like to see people I'm following do too much about their personal life. A little bit's okay, but not too much. Facebook, I just, it's there, I have it, but I'm not really into it. Um, and then Instagram is where I see what my kids have been up to in the last 24 hours with their Snapchats and things like that and how much they're out there embarrassing me or not at, at any particular time. So I like Instagram for photos, but, but I don't use it very much for, um, you know, medicine and, and advocacy in that way. And what are some of your uh, go-to hashtags on Twitter? That's the other thing about me on Twitter. I'm not a big hashtag follower. I'm more... A person follower, right? So, Dave, so I, I tell people who to follow. I tell my students when I, I do a one class at McMaster in ProComp on this issue, I tell them that you should be following Andre Picard, you should be following the other health journalists, uh, Kelly Grant, Kelly Crow from CBC, you should be following. Although she's not great on Twitter, but at least you should know about the stuff that she's doing for cbc.ca, which is longer form journalism on on uh, science and medical issues. Um, David Yurlink, who's, who's the guy who really brought the opioid prescribing crisis to the forefront in Canada, he's great to follow. So I'm more a person follower and and I, you won't find a, me doing a lot of hashtag because it's that's sort of an afterthought for me. Okay, to each their own, I suppose. Yeah. What's the best way for viewers to reach you if they have any questions? Yeah, you can, if you ask me, you know, on, if you reach out to me on Twitter, I can follow you and we can do things that way. I don't mind you uh, putting up my Gmail address, and if you want to, a uh, link to it on the, as part of the interview, that's fine. Um, and obviously the hospital email address is easy to find as well. It, we're now Toronto East Health Network, so T-E-H-N dot C-A first name dot last name kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, so any any of those ways. Great. So thank you so much for your time You're and welcome. answering all of my questions. I really appreciate it, Maureen. Thanks for wanting to do this. Yes.